Um, I'm Melissa Schlinger. I'm here from CASEL, um, which is the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. How many of you are familiar with CASEL? Awesome. Um, one of the things that's been handed out is actually just some information about CASEL, which wasn't the handout I was planning for today, but it does have some good information about who is CASEL, what are we working on, and I'm going to share with you a little bit about that. I do have a handout for this session that was confused with this one, so I'm going to give you an opportunity to request that um, directly at the end. Um, and I also believe it'll be posted along with these slides. Um, when I've presented or when I've attended conferences, I always like to get those things myself through an email as opposed to trying to like dig around a Google folder. So at the end, I'll also give you my contact information and you can just shoot me a note right now from your phone saying, send me the slides in the handout and I'll just pass it right to you. Um, so anyway, thank you again for having me. This is also my first time in Hawaii and um, as someone who has traveled all over the country, it is really a treat to come to Hawaii. I got here on Saturday with my husband, and we left our 11-year-old twins at home. So this is super exciting. And I will say, I just got a text from my sister saying, how will I know if school is canceled tomorrow? They're calling for snow. I thought, oh, not where I am. Um, so thank you so much for having me. It's really a treat. Um, what I wanted to do is just start by giving us a chance to think a little bit about what we're going to be talking about here today. And I think given what we just heard from the presenters, if we can put this a little bit in context. So when, this is a session about school-wide SEL, and I thought the keynote speaker was um, really speaking our language, even though he never said anything about social and emotional learning. Um, when you're thinking about school-wide SEL, I want you to just think about what comes to your mind when you think about that, and how, to, how can you connect that to anything that you heard this morning? So just take 30 seconds to kind of reflect, and then I'll ask a few brave souls to uh, share. So I'm told this ball is some sort of microphone that gets thrown around, and people speak into it. I, 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 I thought this was maybe something that you do here in Hawaii, but I love this idea. We'll see if it works. Has anybody used this before? No, it's really light. But apparently, this is how we're gonna we're gonna play around today. Um, is there anybody that wants to share your thoughts about this question? Oh, come on, who wants to play? All right, ready? <laughs> okay, so I think of uh, soft skills. Uh, like collaboration and, and that sort of, uh, that's what comes to mind. Great, thank you. Here you go, that's fun. Um, as he was describing the schools in the cloud, I was wondering if they have any set of expectations in terms of how the students talk with each other, treat each other, do they go over any sort of, you know, agreements that might help um, create a safe community for the for the learners. Yeah, I wondered that too. It didn't appear that they did. Anybody else <laughs> want to share what comes to your mind when you think about school-wide SEL? Yeah, you ready? Yeah. Sorry. Right. Um, so for school-wide, um, some type of program where you're using the same language and same keywords so you know it's happening in other classrooms, you can build off that and then eventually build some a culture within the school with the students and the faculty and teachers so that we can all like live by it and promote that social emotional learning together. Great, thank you. Great, we're gonna be talking about all of those things. Thank you for sharing what comes to your mind. One thing I notice um, when people call Castle and they ask about school-wide SEL is they often think about just the first part of what you were saying, which is, oh, we're doing school-wide SEL. We have a curriculum in every classroom without really thinking about how that permeates beyond the curriculum into the climate, into the culture, into the way in which we do school. Um, so we're going to be talking a little bit about that. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on who is CASEL and how CASEL defines SEL. CASEL is the organization that coined the term social and emotional learning 25 years ago. And what do we mean by a systemic approach to social and emotional learning? And then specifically at the school level, what does it look like and how do you do it? I'm gonna be sharing some resources with you today that are not available to the public. So some secret websites, some cool stuff that's in development that you can take and use immediately. I'm gonna to try to do a little bit of showing you what it looks like, um, but I felt like how could I come all the way to Hawaii and not show them this stuff that's coming out in January, February of 2019. So if you'll forgive some of the clunkiness to the early drafts, I think you'll get a lot of um, 
a lot of interest in, in exploring those, those uh, resources. Um, so CASEL, as I mentioned, has been around since 1994. Um, and the, the mission of CASEL is to help make SEL a part of education for all kids pre-K to 12. There are three, I don't really like standing here. I'm going to move around a little bit if I can. Um, there are three main ways that we do this at CASEL. There's a group of folks that are um, focused on federal policy and state policy. Um, and in fact, I would be really remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about their policy work, so I added a slide on that. Since, since Hawaii is so interesting that your state, and, yeah, I could use the ball, your state and your district are one and the same, right? It's one school district for the state, which is really interesting. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, also, we have a whole group of researchers at CASEL who are advancing the science of SEL, um, both studying what, what um, causes in, actually impact social emotional learning and impacts on student outcomes, as well as really looking at um, the, the influence of assessment and how do you assess these things, those kinds of things. And then I oversee our practice work, which is what is actually happening in classrooms, schools, and districts around the country. So the Collaborating States Initiative, Robbie, this one's for you. This is actually um, a really exciting part of our policy work. It began with seven states where we um, put out an RFP, seven, we're hoping to get five. We started with seven states. They didn't really get any money. It was just, do you guys want to work together on thinking about your state strategy for SEL? And that five turned into seven, which turned into 11, then 18. We are now at 25 state departments of education who come together a few times a year to collaborate with each other on how they create the conditions at the state level for s districts around the state to, um, to focus on SEL. And when I said I was coming here, they were like, you've got to get Hawaii to be our 26th state. That will put us over the, the tipping point of half. Um, I, when I send you these slides, if you're interested, there's a lot of really interesting learning that's coming out of the state work that you can see here um, by clicking on these resources, or you can just go to CASEL's website. Another important piece I wanted to share with you is um, the research team has uh, an assessment work group that they're focusing on that is really advancing um, information about assessments. And in fact, just on Monday, yes, Monday of this week, they released the assessment guide, which is basically what educators need to know about assessing SEL. And it um, organizes all the frameworks and helps you understand uh, how to assess, what items are available, and how to use those. So if you get these slides, you can click on that and get right to it. You can also go to our website to get that. But that's all I'm going to say about the assessment stuff and the policy stuff. We're going to get right into the practice work. Um, the research behind SEL, I think, is probably familiar to most of you here in Hawaii who has already been focusing on this. Um, but it really is, this particular study is really what created a turning point for SEL in that it became something that people really started paying attention to. Um, this was a meta-analysis that included over 270,000 students. So a meta-analysis is when you take lots of studies and treat them as one big study. And in that one big study, they found that students that participated in social and emotional learning programming, not only did they improve SEL skills, which I think we all thought was the case, but also improved attitudes about self, others in school, positive classroom behavior, and really notably an 11 percentile point gain on standardized achievement tests. And that, I think, is where people started saying, wait, what? Because there's actually academic interventions that don't result in 11 percentile point gain on academic tests. So this was a really big moment where people started paying attention. And remember what was happening at that time with NCLB, to actually really think like, oh, maybe teaching to the test isn't the best way to get kids to improve, but actually addressing the needs of the whole child. Also, we saw reductions in conduct problems and emotional distress. Also really important in this day and age where we see suicide rates at an all-time high, levels of anxiety and depression at um, really uh, high proportions. So the fact that focusing on social and emotional learning can have these positive outcomes and reduce these risks for failure is really important. And um, this particular study, I think, really changed how people were perceiving SEL. A lot of times we heard people talking about like soft skills, warm and fuzzy, oh, that's so sweet, that's really nice, but it's not that important. This changed people to understand, oh, this is actually really important and critical for success. 
Um, there was also a longitudinal meta-analysis done to follow up to see if those changes um, lasted and found that indeed they do, that over time you see higher academic performance, SEL skills, attitudes and positive social behaviors, and reduction in conduct problems, emotional distress, and uh, drug use in long-term follow-up. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these research studies, but you are welcome to go to our website and look at all this in detail, or um, you can check it out more on the slides when I send them to you. This one I thought was sort of interesting. This is actually a longitudinal study that lasted over 20 years to look at kindergarten students who were stronger in SEL to see what happened if you followed those kids for 20 years. And um, in this study, they controlled for socioeconomics and all other factors that could be attributed and found that the kids who were stronger in SEL competence at five years old were more likely to graduate from high school, complete a college degree, obtain stable employment, and less likely to be living in public housing, receiving public assistance, involved with police, or in a detention facility. Um, and what's really exciting about this is while they measured in kindergarten and then followed them, you, you don't have to be born with SEL skills. Like we know from research that you can teach these things. So it's not like if your five-year-old has poor self-management, like, well, they're doomed to public housing, right? Um, it doesn't work like that. There are things that we can do to actually promote social and emotional competence, um, which is good, especially as the mother of kids where you're thinking, ugh. Um, so there are things that we can do and continue to do and do for our adults as well. Uh, we also know that SEL is a good investment. The research here shows you get about an 11 to 1 return on investment. So for every dollar spent on SEL programming, we see a savings of $11 on programming for dropout prevention and recovery, um, remediation, um, and so forth, tier two and tier three interventions. Um, so lots of good reasons to be focusing on SEL. Um, and we also know from talking to principals, teachers, and students themselves that it is a, a all-time high um, priority for all of these different sectors. There's a new study coming out, I don't have the slides for that, um, of a youth survey who have said that this is super important to them. And even students that think that their school's doing a pretty good job at this, when they asked those same kids after they graduated, they were like, oh, you know what, actually, I wasn't as ready as I thought I was now that I'm in the real world to collaborate well with others, to manage conflict, and so forth. Um, so that's the research, and as I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of different definitions about, um, about SEL, and this is the CASEL definition. Um, but one thing I want to make sure we know that SEL is not, is it's not a quick fix, it's not a single program, it is not just for students, it's not um, just for schools, it is not separate from academics, and it is not separate from the work on equity. Um, I think these are some of the most common misconceptions about what SEL is. And if you look at the definition, it is really a process for children and adults. It's not just a one uh, shot in the arm. And you know, our goal is to help understand and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy, um, establish and maintain positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. Um, when we think about the, I guess, you, how, how many of you are familiar with the wheel? Okay, oh, not as many as I would think. I think everyone's sort of like, oh, the wheel, but um, maybe not as many. So there's, the, the way we think about SEL are these competencies that fall into these five buckets. The first two buckets have to do with self. So self-awareness, how do I understand who I am and how I feel? Um, how do I understand myself and my own cultural identity? How do I understand my self-efficacy? Like, do I actually think I'm capable of doing this work? Do I have a growth mindset? Um, recognize what I'm good at. Uh, identifying my own emotions, my cultural assets. These are all part of self-awareness. Same with understanding of my own unconscious bias. It's a really important part of SEL. And then the other part has to do with what do I do with that? So how do I manage my own behavior, my own impulses? How do I deal with stress and anger? How do I stay motivated? How do I persevere? How do I set and achieve goals and so forth? So how do I understand myself? And then what do I do with that in terms of my own individual behavior? These are all part of self-awareness and self-management. The green ones have to do with other people. So social awareness is how do we understand other people? How do we understand the ability to take the perspective of other people, the ability to demonstrate and show empathy, I'm really 
appreciating the diversity, respecting others, really how do we understand others and then again, what do we do with that understanding and how we engage with others? So how do we communicate, how do we collaborate, how do we build relationships, how do we manage conflict, work cooperatively? I mean, these are the things that I thought were so interesting, as you mentioned in that video earlier, like did they establish some norms of behavior or some ways of collaboration or turn taking or which didn't appear that they did. Um, but we know that we can be intentional about actually building these skills. And this is, in fact, what employers are telling us they actually want. Because the internet is so readily available, the technical skills are much easier for us to acquire. Um, but these things really require some intentionality around building them. And then the, the last one is responsible decision making. So this is really about problem solving, analyzing situations, taking all of what we understand about ourselves and others as part of that, um, and behaving ethically. Um, so sometimes people think about SEL and sort of their understanding of it stops right here. They're like, oh, it's skill instruction, which is actually not what Castle is trying to promote when we talk about thinking about SEL, because we're talking about not just promoting these competencies in kids and adults, but also really thinking about where we do that and how that happens. So in a classroom, there are three or four main ways that we are promoting SEL. One has to do with a curriculum or an actual um, explicit instruction or explicit time in the day where the goal of that time is to build those skills. That's super important. But that is not at all it. The second part has to do with how do we embed promotion of SEL while we're teaching math, while we're teaching science, while we're teaching social studies. And I would say that video and the, the speaker this morning was really talking about project-based learning, right? Answering questions and trying to figure out how do we build our social and emotional competence um, while we are engaging with academic content. And then the third one has to do with what's the climate in which we're doing that? Is it a safe environment? He kept talking about the safety of the environment. Is it a place where I can take risks? Is it a place where I feel a sense of belonging? Is it a, a place where I feel known and cared about by other kids and by the teacher? So what's the overall classroom climate? And then I'd say the fourth one is, do the youth have a voice themselves during that classroom time? So can I actually drive my own instruction? Can I have a say in how things are run? Um, can I provide feedback? That lesson wasn't very good. Um, do I actually have an opportunity to be engaged in different ways? And that should happen not just at the classroom, but at the school level. You know, nothing makes me crazier than when schools assess school climate and they never share the, that data back with the students themselves, right? Like, tell the students about what you learned and engage with them as problem solvers. If the kids feel disengaged, ask them why and how we can fix that. Um, so giving youth a voice beyond just student council and patrols, like a real voice in how we create policies and what we, how we think about the school running. Also in the school environment, how do we treat discipline, both in the classroom and in the schools? What's the discipline policy? Is it hey, you misbehaved, you're out? Or are we using those opportunities as ways of actually building skills to help us be more successful, help us understand others' perspectives, and really develop the skills we need to, to not repeat those types of conflicts? Also, how do we engage with our parents and communities? Are we just sending stuff home? Or are we actually really engaging in a two-way conversation with families about the education of their child. Um, are we engaging with our community? Are there community providers that are helping us with our education? Are we doing service learning? Like, how are we really authentically connecting with families and community members as part of this? So when Castle talks about SEL, we are talking about promoting these competencies for students and adults in classrooms, schools, with families and communities. This is what we mean by a systemic approach as opposed to more of a programmatic approach. Um, and this is the model that Castle uses to talk about this. So we talked about the outcomes we're looking for, short, medium, and long-term outcomes, what we're promoting and where we promote it, and then how we do it is through a theory of action, which I'm gonna explain a little bit more. So there's four big buckets of activity. One is, we build a foundational support and plan for SEL. We build the adult's capacity and knowledge. 
we promote SEL for students, and we are continuously improving. So th that's sort of the theory of action. Um, this is like our researchers like, ah, we love this model. When I first saw this, I was like, this does not make any sense to me. It's too many charts. So I try to break it down for you. I think, though, even this, people still get a little bit lost. Like, OK, well, I understand it, but like, what does it actually look like? What does it mean? What are we actually doing? And so um, at the district level, we've broken down that theory of action into 16 activities. So when we partner with a district, we partner with them in all 16 of these things. We help them think about what is the district shared vision, how do you collaborate um, and promote collaboration among schools and district leaders, how do you communicate about SEL as a priority, how do you align your budgets and staffing all towards SEL. This is all sort of foundational things that have to happen at the district level if you want to create schools that can really prioritize SEL. Also, we know that you not only need to develop expertise in SEL, but that the adults themselves need to have their own social and emotional competence, and there needs to be professional learning to help achieve both of those. So, you know, I'm sure you all have seen teachers that do a great job with an SEL lesson, but then yell at their kids like five minutes after it's over, right? Like that, the kids pick up on that, right? That's not an authentic uh, modeling um, and relationship building. Um, also, making sure that, um, that you're providing access and opportunity for all students. Um, promoting SEL for students um, really comes down to how do we think about standards? So what should kids know and be able to do? If we don't define that, it's really tricky. Like, what's appropriate empathy for a five-year-old versus a 15-year-old? It's not the same. How do we actually scaffold our instruction and our work so that we are promoting what's reasonably and developmentally appropriate for students at different ages? And how do we define that so that we're all on the same page? Um, implementing evidence-based programs and practices is critically important and some of the things that really can anchor the work. Um, developing those family and community partnerships and then integrating SEL with all of our other important work like academics, di district priorities and policies, discipline and so forth. And then the data for continuous improvement, we use this plan, do, study, act cycle where we really want to make sure that we're looking at implementation data and outcome data and that we're regularly reporting out on what's happening, what milestones we're hitting, which ones we're not hitting, and what to do about it. Um, I, so I mentioned earlier that the Collaborating Districts Initiative is really where Castle's gotten super smart about what happens in districts. We started in 2011 with a collaboration with eight districts to answer these questions. What does it mean to systemically implement SEL in a large urban district? Is that a reasonable thing to do, given what we know about large urban districts? And what happens when you do that with kids? Uh, we started with these eight districts. And frankly, we started with eight because we were like, surely we'll lose three or four, right? I mean, so that feasibility question, we were not really sure. So we thought, let's start with eight. And hopefully, we'll get three or four to stick around long enough so we can get some good data. And what we did was we um, provided technical assistance to those districts based on a theory of action. The one that I just showed you actually is an evolved theory of action. We, we developed with them a, a, um, a theory of action. And we provided technical assistance with those districts on executing that. And then we also created these tools to support their implementation. And then we brought them together all the time to help them learn from each other. And I will say, what I would love to say it's Castle's technical assistance that really helped them advance their work. I would say this third, this last bullet is how they got, how they and we got the smartest by having them just share with each other what's going well, what's not going well. How do we do this in high school? What are you doing about your code of conduct? What does the teachers union have to say about that? The real on the ground challenges that they faced and they shared with each other. Um, now, not only did none of those eight districts drop out, these are the districts that we're now working with, um, which definitely surprised us as much as anybody. Um, because in those original eight districts, those superintendents have turned over 25 times since 2011. So our hypothesis that if a superintendent left, this would go away with them was wrong. That because the work was systemic, and they were finding that they were actually really making good gains. Um, and then what we also found happened was some of these superintendents were leaving and going to new districts and saying, this was one of the most important things I was doing. 
I want this to follow me. So the superintendent in Atlanta, Georgia, went, came from Austin, moved to Atlanta after the worst cheating scandal in education in this country history, um, and said, I have to be a part of this learning community, and I need to prioritize SEL, and I need the technical assistance. So we brought her and Atlanta Public Schools on as our ninth district. And then in El Paso, they called and said, hey, we had a cheating scandal. Can we be part of the CDI? <laughs> <laughs> which wasn't exactly what we had in mind, but you know, so then El Paso came on. Then this next chunk of districts came on board as part of a research study to evaluate what happens when you align during school and out of school time, so in the process of that study. And then these last four just kept raising their hands saying we want to be a part of this as well. So we now have over 20 districts that we're partnering with to support their systemic approach to SEL. Um, in that study, we learned that um, it is possible to do SEL implementation and that we saw positive growth in both uh, districts and schools. We saw improvements in climate, improvements in social and emotional competence. Uh, we've seen academic outcomes, improvements in attendance, and reductions in suspensions. All this research is on our website, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but there's um, obviously deep reports. This research was conducted by the American Institute for Research. Um, but I think the real question that people want to know is, like, what does it actually mean to do it? So one thing that I, this is the handout that you were supposed to get, was what does it actually mean? Castle published what's called the 10 key indicators of school-wide SEL to help take that wheel and put it into clearer language. Um, so if you email me at the end of this presentation, I will send you this. This is, to me, one of the most important things we can do to communicate about what it is that we mean. So there's 10 things. And for some people, this can be really overwhelming to think 10 things. Oh my god, how am I going to get through 10 things? Remember, this is not a quick fix. This is not a sprint. This is definitely a marathon. It takes three to five years to really implement in all of these areas. And it takes a forever commitment to really um, to, to continue to do this in, in a long-term way um, and to get those outcomes. Now, you will see outcomes quickly in certain areas. Like climate tends to improve pretty quickly with some effort. Um, attendance can improve pretty quickly. But if you're really looking for the long haul, um, then this is definitely at least a three to five years implementation plan to get to, to really deeply implement all these. So the first one I mentioned is this explicit instruction. We really do believe there should be time dedicated in the day to building those skills. Um, there are some schools and districts that are resistant to that. They're like, oh, I'd really rather embed it in academics and we'll do some assemblies and we'll, we'll work on our climate, which those are all great too. But this explicit time um, really does anchor the implementation. And what we've seen is that when things get crazy and chaos hits, this tends to be the thing, the programming that stays. That like the teachers don't fall back into their old ways and the school doesn't, you know, the principal turns over. Like that really does tend to anchor districts and schools in their work if they have some dedicated explicit SEL instruction. Um, if you're not familiar, On Castle's website is a program review, so you can actually see all the programs that are out there that have been tested. Um, it's like a consumer report style guide. So we think that's really important, but it's by no means sufficient. And unfortunately, a lot of people stop there. And you can see that there's these nine other things that are also really important. Um, the second one is integrate it with academic instruction, that we really need to be promoting SEL while teaching. Um, and I realize I'm not doing a very good job of modeling this, but really making sure that the teacher isn't the only one talking, that it is really more student talk and less teacher talk, more collaboration, more opportunities for perspective taking, um, so that kids are really promoting their SEL competence while getting the information. The third one I mentioned earlier, youth voice and engagement. So how do we give the youth their own opportunity to um, meaningfully engage in their school? Um, and then the fourth one is supportive school and classroom climate. So I mentioned these a little bit earlier, but this is now spelling it out, that you have an environment where you feel known and loved by your teacher and your classmates and feel like it's a safe place to be. Um, the, f the fifth one, the focus on adult SEL. When Castle started this work in 2011 with the CDI, 
We didn't have that as a priority. We didn't even really understand how important that was. This was one of those aha moments we've made over the last eight years, like, hey, if you don't focus on the adult SEL, the school stuff doesn't get sustained. So it's so super important that we have now have a whole bucket in our district theory of action and a, a, se a whole section in our school guide on the, the adults and their own social and emotional competence. Supportive discipline, and obviously these are related too, right? So supportive discipline, are we doing more of a restorative approach or more of a sort of rules and consequences approach? Um, and by the way, like rules and consequences are good. I, I'm not saying that you should have no rules or consequences. It's really about how you create discipline and structures that have a long-term effect. So one example I often give on this one is, you know, I've been into lots of schools that do a great job of keeping quiet halls. Like it is like you could hear a pin drop in these schools, right? But some of those schools have like a really strict rule about you don't talk in the hall, and if you do talk in the hall, you're issued a demerit, right? So they got really quiet halls. Another school may have taken a different approach to really focus on why don't we talk in the hall? What's happening in those classrooms? What's it like being in a classroom when there's noise in the hall? And actually building more empathy and reflection on why you would be more likely, why you should be quiet when you're in the hall, so as not to disturb your, your fellow schoolmates while they're trying to learn and to create an environment that you want to be in. Those students that have that perspective of why they're quiet in the hall are much more likely to be quiet in the library, in the theater, in the museum, because they've, they've developed some skills about looking in my environment, thinking about my behavior, how does it impact other people? So that's what we're talking about when we're thinking about how do we promote social and emotional competence as part of, the, um, as part of our practices. Um, let's move on to continuum of integrated supports. Do you all use MTSS here? A multi-tiered system of support? Yes. Yeah, so the, a lot of times we think about that as an academic triangle only, like tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, we also like to think about the, there's the academic side, the behavior side, the SEL piece lies between them both, right? So you need the social and emotional um, supports at tier one, two, and three to support both academics and behaviors. Um, authentic family partnerships, Aligned community partnerships, we talked a little bit about those, and systems for continuous improvement. If you have a school that is doing all of these things, that is a school that we would say, that is what we're talking about when we talk about a systemic approach to school-wide SEL. So a lot of times I think people can feel like, oh my god, I thought we were just going to be talking about like a climate strategy. This feels like a whole ton of information. Um, and I think my teachers would be overwhelmed because they're already overwhelmed with what's put on their plate. Um, so one of the things that we've tried to do and we've built with our schools is actually a guide for a process on how to do this. And again, this is not a do this in a month or do this in a year, it's do this over several years. And it's a five part process that takes us through a process that achieves those things. Um, this is where I'm gonna start showing you the secret website. So we are getting ready to launch in, I think, January or February, an online resources for free that gives you everything you would need to know about how to do these things. Um, right now, you're going to have to just take my word for it, but you can, you can go explore on the guide. Um, after watching those kids learn about trigonometry, I'm certain if you click around on this site for, with a group, you'll get everything you need to know. So the first step has to do with building awareness, commitment, and ownership. By the way, this was also something that we didn't have in our earlier versions. We like launched right into a vision and plan and realized, huh, these teachers are engaging in a vision exercise without actually understanding what SEL is or why I should even care about it. So we added in a whole section on building awareness, commitment, and ownership as a key first step so that the whole staff really understands what we're doing here. The steps that are included in there have to do with establishing an SEL team, doing some foundational SEL work, and uh, communications planning. Then we get into our shared vision, and then we can actually get into actually planning out, okay, what are we going to do to execute against that vision? How will we achieve the vision? But there's some really important steps, and unfortunately, a lot of people like to jump right into the planner. Um, 
The next part, cultivating adult SEL, I mentioned this one was super important as well. Um, professional learning is obviously critical, but the adult SEL piece, we really underestimated that. And when we talk about adult SEL in this guide, we're talking about three things. One is their own SEL competence. How do they manage their stress? How do we think about our own unconscious bias? How do we manage and understand our emotions? How do we collaborate with other adults? All of that piece is so critical. Um, the collaborating means, like, does our school actually give us opportunities to work with each other in a positive community building way? Or is that not even an option for us? And then how are we m intentionally modeling the behaviors that we wanna see? Promoting SEL for students is obviously the biggest section. So what are the school level policies and practices? What do we do in our classroom and school climate? How do we integrate this into instruction? What do we do for explicit SEL? And how do we engage with our families and communities? And then lastly, the data for continuous improvement, which is in fact embedded into the whole thing, but um, there's a whole section on that. Um, so what I wanna do is actually show you this website. It's schoolguide.castle.org. So, uh, you're, you're not going to find that on our website, um, but that's what it is. And we're actually getting ready to launch this nationally next year. So it's a, it, it says beta version. It's not quite done. We've learned a lot along the way. Um, but the implementation of SEL is broken down here, and I'll show you what this looks like. Okay, so... Here are the, the sections. It's going to look a little bit like different, but each section has its own um, area that you can explore, and it's pretty easy to navigate. So if I was in the very beginning of my work, one of the very first things that I would do is create a team. And actually, that sounds like a pretty simple thing to do, right? Like, okay, you, 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 you're our SEL team, right? It's actually not how we'd recommend that you do it. Um, so there's a lot of information here on how do you create the right team to lead the SEL work. And then there's tools. So how should I assemble an SEL team? And it actually gives you checklists to think about like who should be on that team. Choose a team structure. There's some um, downloadable uh, documents that you can work on. What are the responsibilities of each person on the team? And so forth. Um, or if I wanted to look at team roles and responsibilities, I can define those here. So there's lots of different, um, lots of different resources that you can use just to create a team because we think that that's really important. Each of the sections has these buckets at the bottom, so you can go in and kind of pick which one or, or go through all of them. And this is just for creating a team. So it's really, really a step-by-step -step process. Um, for how to, to do this work. If you said, you know, we already have a team, we actually wanna do some SEL 101, then here I would go and say, I've got the SEL 101, but what should I do? And you can see that there are some resources and PowerPoint slides that you can use to do an SEL 101 at your school. I get a lot of requests, can you come and do an SEL 101? But really, the SEL team should own and do that SEL 101. And there's a, a lot of resources in here on how to do that. Um, and also resources for um, parents on how to talk about SEL in Spanish and in English and so forth. Um, there's also in the planner section, and this is what's gonna be so much better in January, but you can see what it looks like now, is, um, an actual rubric. So sometimes people say, well, like, I, I think I'm doing great. I already know. Um, but you can actually go through, I think there's 25 items, and rate yourself. This is not something that you should zip through. I would say get with your SEL team, plan an hour, and ask yourself, where are you? What would you give yourself as a score? A one, two, three, or four on each item? It can be really helpful to actually have each individual do it for homework and then come together and compare scores. So like just even on that one that we were talking about, an SEL team, a four, which is what we would say is the gold star, a four is an SEL team with designated roles and responsibilities meets at least monthly to lead school-wide SEL and communicate broadly about SEL to all stakeholders. Students, families, and community groups are represented on the team and are part of the decision-making process. So it's a, to get a four, that's like a serious, um, level of 
SEL teams. So for each one of these, you can see a one, two, three, or four and um, rate yourself. So foundational learning, are you doing SEL 101 for everyone, like including your cafeteria workers, including your front office staff, including your safety folks? So that's how you end up with a four. Um, what's, I can't show you, but what's coming in January or February is that after you score yourself on all of these, you can have a, you have an opportunity to say, uh, I wanna make this a priority area. So let's say like, you know what, I, I have an, an SEL 101, but I could really use some beefing up. I wanna make this a priority and it puts it into a plan for you. It, it shows you here's what a four is, here's what you scored yourself as, here's what you told us you were already doing and what you wanna do, and then a place to actually develop a plan. So we would say don't ever choose more than five to seven goals or you'll make yourself crazy. But being able to use this planner to generate a, a SEL implementation plan so that you actually know what are we working on and it will all be automated and integrated. So we're really, really excited about that. Um, but even right now, you can take this rubric. The rubric isn't gonna change, so you can play around with it and see where you are. Um, it's organized by those five, those five key activities. So like on key activity three, um, what professional learning have you done? Do you have an environment that supports adult SEL? Have you done some staff shared agreements? Are you um, focusing on cultural responsiveness? Um, and so forth. The key activity four is where you have the most. Um, so here we've got the professional learning on building SEL for students. Is there a positive learning environment? Classroom shared agreements, youth voice, instructional strategies, SEL and academic integration, evidence-based SEL instruction. Now I will say, sometimes people are like, I, I can't even do this rubric because I'm so early on. Like I, this is just upsetting me. So don't feel like you have to take all 25 items at one time. If you, if you really are at the very beginning of your work, the way that we're gonna break this down in the future, but you can still just, just focus on the first couple key activities and just call it a day. Because it can get demoralizing to just keep giving yourself one, one, one across the board, um, but it is kind of a good exercise to see like what is the full breadth of what we're talking about here. Um, so I hope that that will be something that you guys can play around with and see um, where you are and what you um, where you'll go from there because uh, that's part of the part of the challenge. I'm going to take a quick break and ask you a question. Given what we just talked about. Um, Look at those five key activities, building awareness, commitment, and ownership, establishing a shared vision and plan, cultivating adults, promoting SEL for students, or data for continuous improvement. Think about like in your mind, which of these areas do you think is most relevant for your work? And then turn to the person next to you and just share where you think like if you were gonna really focus on this, where would you wanna focus your attention right now? So let's just take like a minute to talk to your neighbor. Okay, uh, let's come back together. Um, where's that ball? Oh, I've got it. Who is willing to share um, about where you are in your school and what you think is the most relevant place for you to dig in if you were to get into this guide? You're not in a school. She's like, don't look at me, I'm not in a school. Um, who can share? Come on, you just shared with your partner. Can't you share with us? I've got this fun ball. All right, you're gonna have to stand up though because I don't think I can get it to you. I'm a school counselor um, at my school and so I'm part of, we've been, we're in our third year of implementing Ruler. Actually. Oh good. Um, but I think some, for us what's really important right now I think is going back to digging a little deeper with the build awareness, commitment and ownership and also the cultivating adult SEL, like how do we get that going? We did that really strongly the first year, but I think it has to be something that we're revisiting and there's new people and how, so how do we keep that? Yep, so great, thank you. Uh, who else will share? How about somebody over here so she doesn't have to throw it as far? <laughs> wow, quiet group. Okay, well I'll take it back. Um, or you can just pass it back. I'm afraid if you throw it to me, I won't catch it. Um, so sometimes people are like, well, this is just really overwhelming. What could I do right now? Um, and a lot of our schools and districts have adopted something that they call the three signature practices, which they implement 
immediately day one. And it seems really simple, but you'd be surprised at what a big impact it can have on schools when they, when they adopt this as like, we're gonna start doing this. And in fact, I'll, I'll never forget the superintendent in Oakland, which is who, where they, this was sort of born, he began doing this in all of his cabinet level meetings, all of his staff meetings, that he started every meeting with some sort of welcoming ritual. And by the way, like we do this at Castle. Every time I have a practice meeting, which is um, on Mondays at 1030, we start with a five minute community builder and there's 15 of us in there. And it could just be like, what are you reading right now? Or like, what's your favorite Halloween costume you ever had? Or, you know, um, just some quick question that gets people to share just a little bit about each other um, to get them to people to know each other more. If you go on our website, and it's actually embedded in the school guide, uh, there's actually a, a SEL three signature practices playbook, which is like a whole downloadable guide on how to do a welcoming ritual. I am really oversimplifying it here. It, it has a, there's a science to it, to doing it well and to doing it in a way that engages all people. But starting opportunities where we gather with a welcoming ritual gets people talking. Um, and then there's some, a list of engaging practices to embed throughout any given lesson or meeting or um, whether it's a processing moment or a brain break or what have you to in, uh, infuse that into the, the session. And then some sort of optimistic closure, some way of sort of wrapping up or thinking forward about what you just experienced. This is um, just like a really quick way to begin doing SEL in both the way in which you interact with staff and the way in which you interact with students immediately um, and can be a really powerful way of sort of having a common language, a common way of doing things. Definitely go on the website and download the, ho the whole packet on it because you can spend just 30 minutes or an hour sharing with your staff about how are we going to do this. Um, and it can really help people really get their head in the game on, on, um, the, on how to get moving within that direction. Um, I wanted to show you this video, and I'm really bummed that there's no audio. I'm gonna, I, I don't think I can get it to work, because we tried a couple times. Um, if you wanna actually see what it looks like in a, in a school, this video is my favorite video. And I have to say, this school is kind of my favorite school. This is a school on the far south side of Chicago. And I know you guys, even all the way here in Hawaii, know about Chicago and the crime and the violence and the poverty. And um, this school is in that kind of a neighborhood that you're thinking of when you hear those stories. Um, they have one of the highest percentages of incarcerated parents at this school. They have 40% mobility rate. So almost half the, cast, the students who come in September won't be there in June because they've moved out and a whole new crop will come in. This is definitely the kind of school that people would say, can't do it there. Too much mobility, too much poverty, not our kids, they've got too much going on. Um, they, they have, every time people come to Chicago and they wanna see what SEL looks like, I take them here. It's my favorite place. Um, they've done such a beautiful job and they have um, embedded evidence-based programs and they've done some mindfulness work and they've done um, engagement with parents and it's such a great video. I know I'm kind of talking about, but I'm gonna email you this PowerPoint. Please take five minutes to click on this video because I think it's so reassuring to know like that, this is not rocket science. This can be done, um, and it's really been transformative for them and for many other schools. Chicago Public Schools actually has something called an SEL ex um, certification process where schools can apply to be, it's called a supportive schools um, certification, and you can get um, emerging, established, or exemplary, and they have um, dozens of schools at that exemplary level, and they've got, um, hundreds at the established level. So they're doing great work in this space. So definitely spend some time there. The Office of Social and Emotional Learning congratulates schools that have earned CPS Supportive School Certification and celebrates their strong multi-tiered system of supports for students 
supportive schools are really the places where you walk in and you can feel automatically that the culture is warm, welcoming, it's productive. The students in the building feel safe. They feel connected both to each other and to the adults in the building. We have an exemplary supportive staff and community of stakeholders. We saw that there was a need to really support our students on another level outside of what we were doing academically. Our goal is to make sure that 100% of our students are college and career ready. We felt like we really needed to put some additional supports in place in order to meet all of those needs. And that missing piece was really that social emotional learning piece. For us, it started with really having a strong SEL team. They basically solicit others to participate on the team as volunteer. Once the team comes together, then they plan their professional development for the year. We attend monthly meetings with our network SEL, and we bring that information back and provide professional development uh, to the teachers. They're giving us strategies that we can use with our classroom. So we spent this year um, really motivating the teachers, um, keeping them empowered, giving them help when they need help. We all did spent the first week or so getting to know our students through classroom building activities and that created positive relationships. School to me has always been about nurturing students rather than just teaching them. You can't teach them anything if you don't know them. We look at it more of being proactive. So we're putting the things in place so that we do not have to deal with the issues that sometimes take away from the instructional time, behavior issues, absenteeism, and also with referrals to the office. Students are spending more time in class and more time in class equals more instructional time. We all have school norms collectively. SEL is spoken through our student work. It's learning how to self-manage and problem solve and use critical thinking. We literally live SEL here. If someone was visiting, they would see a common language. Our students know how to walk and conduct themselves in the hallway. So how we line up, how we enter the building, how we get our lunch, that we say good afternoon, that we say please, that we say thank you. And they understand that from pre-K through eighth grade that these are the expectations. So today we learned why it's important to check our assumptions, especially when you have your strong emotions. Why is it important to check them? Sometimes when you're mad and you make a decision, you don't know what you're doing or you just don't be thinking, you just act. When we first started out, we started out with Second Step. And Second Step was a program that we felt that they could really implement on the ground floor, getting to really know and understand the social emotional learning standards with fidelity. By writing her diary um, that her mom had bought her. So even today, if you have something that you're going through, what do we do? You can still pour out all your emotions in your journal. How is that an excellent way to manage your emotions? From there, we started doing lesson integration. We wanted to show that this was something you can do without just having a program and that it would be actually intertwined into our entire curriculum. So it just comes natural when you're talking about characters. Today with Sharon Draper's book, Fire from the Rock, is we were talking about the main character, Sylvia, and how she had to manage her emotions going through this difficult time. So it just seemed natural to me to kind of weave them together. I'm thinking about how the students are going to react to the certain challenges that the characters are facing. And they can see that, okay, well this is social emotional learning and it's an everyday kind of thing. I really enjoy teaching SEL. It's embedded throughout the day. It's not separate for us. I find time for it during reading, during a read aloud, during a math talk, working in cooperative groups. Today's topic for our Monday Mentoring Group is using emotions as a guide to decision making. With the Monday Mentoring Program, that's really taken us to a different level because it ensures that every student in the building has a relationship with someone other than just their classroom teacher. The students feeling at home or this being a safe environment for them. One of the things that we really push is really understanding your emotions and how emotions impact actions, decisions, and consequences. Taking responsibility for self, responsible decision making, and goal setting. These are things that, you know, the students have to own themselves. And so we do a lot of that with Monday Mentoring. Let's try to be still like a statue. Okay, our minute to relax.
So yoga is through mindful practice. That's a component of our social emotional learning. We receive professional development on it as a staff, some team building activities for us, enhancing like their listening skills, their communication skills. So it's really building that community. Just something that you're stressing about that you want to let go. Many times we talked about having our journal where we write stuff down because sometimes we have to get it out. Children need to have strategies in place to solve problems and control their emotions. When there's a disagreement, we come up to the classroom and we solve that disagreement, whether it be has a whole class or in the Peace Center. If we need to talk about it a little more, then we'll spend that time. We have peer supports, and so they may be referred to the Peace Center or some restorative conversations. If a student needs individual time by themselves, each classroom or even the library, the gym, we have what's called a Peace Center. And it's just a little corner of the room that the teacher has set aside where the students can calm down. And in each Peace Center, it's what's called a calm down bottle. It's just a water bottle with glitter in it and they shake it and they watch the glitter fall and it calms them down and it works. We have a lot of partnerships with different agencies, so it may be a referral to Universal Family Connections, which provides our on-site counseling and off-site counseling. When we're meeting their need at the tier one, tier two level, then it really doesn't escalate to the need for the tier three services. Do you have a friend on your left side? Do you have a friend on your right side? Relationships are very key, and for us it starts with our relationships as adults with one another. We're modeling those appropriate behaviors for our students and also our interaction with our parents. Today is the kickoff of Week of the Young Child, so guess what? I have some love notes from your parents. We had parents write love letters to their children, which we displayed all throughout the school, and I don't think people realize how much what that does for a child. It says, Jada, keep on doing a great job in school. I am very proud of you and love you very much. Love, Dad. This love note is for Micah. You are so nice and sweet. I love you. Love, Mommy. <laughs> but the way we speak to each other, the way I speak to colleagues, the way I speak to children, the way students talk to each other. We need the same skills that the students need in order to be successful. So the first thing to discuss on our agenda is Red Nose Day. In addition to wearing our colors, do something else to like show that pride for Marcus Garvey. We have a lot of students, they've actually grown up in this SEL environment, so they're training the younger students to be more involved. So they know what to say, they know what to look for, they know what to show. I just feel like it's an integral part of what we do. Kids are more responsible. They actually take charge of their own learning. They become excellent speakers and they can solve their own problems. You can't really have success on the academic level without meeting their social emotional needs. It's necessary to really have a holistic approach to the needs of our students in order to have a very productive school. For more information and guidance on becoming a CPS supportive school, visit the Office of Social and Emotional Learning's Knowledge Center page or send us an email. Okay, so let's let's just reflect for a minute. We only have five more minutes. Um, was there anything that you heard today that surprised you or something that might change how you think about this work? I'm interested in kind of hearing a little bit about your reaction to what was shared. I won't even make you throw the ball. Yes. I was surprised um, to hear the component about student voice and how important that is. Um, and I wanted to think more about how um, how that can like systemically be a part of developing our SEL programming. Great. That's um, getting a lot of attention nationally. I think um, you know you only have to look at those students in Parkland to see what can happen when youth take charge and want to send a message. Um, and how do we cultivate that in our students and honor their voice? In uh, and I was happy to hear your superintendent talking about that today too. That was great. What else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
yeah and actually here's another little newsworthy item in january um, there's actually a national commission on social emotional and academic development that's been meeting for a couple of years in washington dc and there are five groups that meet within that commission there's a group of researchers a group of practitioners a group of policymakers, a group of youth and a group of um, youth development so after school type of folks um, that, and, and each group is like a hundred, and they've been working together on recommendations and a report. So you know how you hear like report, report to the nation. Um, this is actually a report from the nation that will be launched January 15th in Washington DC. And I really believe that um, this will just add to the growing momentum of SEL and people really understanding that this is um, something that all sectors are saying is critically important for, to transform education in this country. So yeah, it's exciting. What else? Any other reflections on this? Yeah. Um, so for me, um, so I'm a little bit newer into this SEL world, but came from the Common Core professional development in a huge way. Um, so I loved the 11% stat on the impact because I think there's a lot of people out there as important as most people know it is there's still a lot of people who are very resistant because of all the reasons you talked about and how much teachers have going on and schools have going on and all those things and I think the connection between the academics which is where all those people have lived and breathed for so long the more we can show that it has an impact on academics I think we'll have a lot more buy-in yeah. yeah. so I love that stat I just didn't know yeah. great thank you um, what other questions do you have um, or comments just generally about what was shared here today? Yeah. Um, I have to say I really love your three signature practices. Oh. That's something that teachers are always asking. How do I do this in math and how do I do this in science? And this is beautiful and I'll leave it in the back. Spot. Great. Definitely get the whole guide from the website because it's pretty robust and um, can be a great way to facilitate that. Any other questions? Yeah. There's an upcoming conference in February, I believe, February 2019. Is it Castle that's Castle is having a conference in October of 2019 um, that will be in Chicago uh, in February. There are a number of other, like the Nashville Public Schools does a conference in the summer. I'm trying to think what that might be in February. Um, I'm not, I, it's not on my radar, but Castle will be having the first ever conference in October of 2019 before it gets freezing cold, hopefully. Any other comments or questions? Okay, so what I'm gonna do, uh, want you to do right now, if you want those slides and or the handout, um, you can either email me directly, or especially if you have questions, or um, my assistant, Marcus, um, and ask him, j just put it in, say, like, please send slides or, or what have you, and he'll send those out to you today. Um, and then really need to look at that video, because I think that will be, really puts everything in perspective. Um, and then I think I, I, that there's a way that you can access that stuff on the app or in the Google folder, too. So it will certainly be there. I was on the app earlier today, and I got a little nervous because it had my session and it had like rate this presenter. So I guess um, I would love to hear from you about how this session went and if it met your needs of why you came here and if there's things that you think could be more helpful because I'm repeating this session tomorrow at 10.30. Um, also, if you have colleagues here that you're like, oh, this was actually helpful for us, please send them. But if you have feedback for me, if there's a way to do it on the app or if you want to just stick around afterwards, um, that would be really helpful to me too. So. And with that, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me here in your beautiful state.